So this is part two of suspension geometry and the first half of this video is going to be about roll center and pitch center and the second half is going to be about the double wishbone suspension and the McPherson strut and I wanted to cover other topics too like the Ackerman string geometry and the multi-link suspension but the video was getting way too long again so I decided to uh, make a separate video on the Ackerman string geometry which hopefully should be up in a few days because I'm already almost done with that one but for the multi-link suspension and other types of suspensions I decided to leave that for a different video again because these two videos should cover most of everything you need to know for the front suspension anyways and for the rear suspension I'll probably just make a different video a part 3 that will cover all the different types of rear suspensions used in cars. So starting off with roll center and pitch center so you would have noticed that whenever a car goes through a corner the body rolls towards one side which is the outside of the corner so roll center is simply an imaginary point along which the body will roll so you can think of, think of it as a pivot point along which the entire body rolls it's a virtual point, there's nothing at this point, but the car's body generally rolls around this point because of the way the suspension geometry is set up. And likewise, pitch center is basically the same thing but in pitch, so like when you go on the brakes, this is the point along which your car's body will pitch forwards. And the reason why roll center and pitch center are important in racing is because they can determine a few different characteristics of uh, how your car will behave through a corner. So just to give you an example, let's just say the red dot is the center of gravity of your car, so that's the point on which all the forces will act when your car goes through a corner and the blue dot is your roll center. So let's say in this case you set the roll center exactly at the road surface and let's say now you take a left turn so you're turning your car left so this will have a force on your car's body that is pulling it towards the outside of the corner so towards the right so that's why the red arrow on the center of gravity is pulling the car towards the right and you can imagine that this force will have a rotational force on the car's roll center since the roll center is lower than this point so it will try to rotate the car's body towards the outside of the corner. And that's what basically causes body roll. But now let's say you are to move the roll center, so rather than it being at the road surface, you make it slightly higher than the road surface. So you can imagine if you move the roll center closer to the center of gravity, you're reducing the distance between these two points, the pivot point and the point at which the force is. So you reduce the torque at this actual roll center, which means that there will be less rotation force trying to move your car's body work sideways which means that your car will roll less because of this. And if you were to move your roll center all the way up to the same point where your car's center of gravity is, you would reach a point where there would be no body roll. So then your car will go through a corner and it will not roll at all because there would be no rotational force at this point. So from that example, it might seem like the higher up you move your roll center, the better it is. But there's one more thing that comes into play. And that's the sideways force that your contact patch basically applies on the roll center because of the way your suspension control arms and everything have to line up to um, provide that roll center. And what that does is whenever your roll center is higher than the road surface, this force will also obviously have a vertical component indicated by the yellow arrow. So what this vertical component does is it lifts the car up every time it goes through a corner. And this effect is called jacking. So every time you go through a corner, your car not only rolls sideways, it also lifts up slightly, considering your roll center is higher than the road surface. And obviously that's not too desirable because if you're lifting your car up every time it's cornering, um, you're raising your center of gravity up, which will cause excessive weight transfer to the outside tires, which is not a good thing in racing. So that's why there's two things that come into play when choosing your roll center. So the first thing is getting your roll center closer to the center of gravity, which is to reduce body roll. And the second thing is keeping your roll center as low to the road surface as possible to reduce this jacking force because you don't want to lift your car too much either. So in most cars the roll center would be placed just slightly above the road surface because um, placing it above the road surface does provide a bit of jacking force but then at the same time you are getting it closer to the car's center of gravity. And the other thing is a slight bit of jacking force can sometimes be beneficial in preventing bottom out. Bottom out is basically when your suspension reaches its full limit of compression and then it can't compress any further. So that's obviously not a good thing to reach bottom out whenever you're going through a corner. So a slight bit of jacking force can lift your car slightly higher and prevent your suspension from bottoming out too easily. And keeping your roll center slightly higher from the road surface also gets it closer to the car's center of gravity so it will minimize body roll at the same time. So that's why that's often the most preferred roll center, keeping it slightly higher than the road surface. And that's actually where you'll find it in most racing cars and also in most regular cars. It will be located slightly above the road surface. So talking about how to measure and adjust roll center, I'm just going to give you this example over here with the double wishbone suspension since that's the most commonly used in racing. So let's say you have this car and uh, you're looking at it from the front view, so these are the four control arms that you see. 
And if you draw these yellow lines to the upper control arm and the lower control arm, you'll see that they'll intersect at a certain point because you would have noticed that on most racing cars at least, the control arms are at a certain angle, they're not completely parallel to each other. And the point at which these lines intersect, if you draw this blue line from that point to the center of your contact patch on your tires, and then you do the exact same thing on the other side, you would notice that these two blue lines will intersect at a certain point. And that point is your roll center. Now this is a bit of an estimation because when your car actually does go through a corner, all your control arms do move so they don't stay at the exact same angle, uh, which is why this point slightly changes. But it's still a fairly accurate indication of where your roll center would be if you're trying to uh, adjust your roll center. And talking about one of the common problems that people run into when tuning their cars for racing is that when they lower their cars, the angle of all these control arms changes when you lower your car. So now if you do the same thing, this is a bit of an exaggerated example, the car is lowered a bit too much, but still it shows you that the roll center moves fairly low whenever you lower your car. So that's actually one of the drawbacks of lowering your car because it changes the angle of all your control arms and then your roll center is actually at a much lower point which causes excessive body roll. So some of the things that people do to fix this is you'll hear about ball joint spacers or different ball joints that people add on their suspensions that can raise or lower the control arm to basically make it leveled again so the roll center is at the same point where it was before. Um, some extreme time attack cars will actually cut and weld their suspension at a new mounting point to fix this, to fix the roll center. But in racing you'll most often see cars with multiple suspension attachment points anyway so that when they go from one track to another and they change their suspension setup they can simply unbolt the control arm and bolt the control arm at a new point so that they can control the roll center much better. So now talking about pitch center, pitch center is pretty similar to roll center but looking at everything from the side view this time. So you would have seen a geometry like this most commonly on the front suspensions of most cars that they angle the upper control arm slightly backwards, like they offset it from horizontal. And what this does is, if you imagine the control arm moving upwards, you would notice that the lower control arm would move up straight vertically, whereas the upper control arm would move slightly backwards. Which means that when they both move up, this will have a slight rotation force on the wheel. It will move the, it will rotate the entire wheel backwards. And if you're rotating the wheel as you're moving the suspension up, that also means that the rotational forces on the wheel will have a lifting force on the suspension. So basically every time you go on the brakes, it will have a slight lifting force on the car, which is actually a good thing because this can be used to counter the uh, front diving down every time you go on the brakes. And at the rear, they do the opposite thing. So rather than pointing the upper control arm backwards, they actually point it forwards. And in most rear wheel drive cars, that is often used as an anti-squat geometry. So when you go on the power rather than the rear squatting down, that can be used to prevent that from happening. So pitch center is simply changed by changing your position of your control arms from horizontal while looking at them from a side view. So measuring pitch center is actually pretty similar to measuring roll center. You just draw these yellow lines passing through the ball joints of your lower control arm and your upper control arm and then the same way the point at which these lines intersect you just draw this blue line that's intersecting that point and the contact patch on your tires. You do the same thing at the front and then you end up with that point which is your pitch center this time. So that's the point along which your car will pitch forwards every time you go on the brakes. So now talking about some of the different types of suspensions, I'm going to start off by explaining the double wishbone suspension since I've already talked about it. So basically a double wishbone suspension is just a suspension where you have two control arms, an upper control arm and a lower control arm. They can be called control arms or wishbones, because wishbones because they're shaped like a wishbone. And the upper control arm is usually smaller than the lower control arm, that's to provide some camber gains, which I'm also going to later talk about. So from the previous video you would already know that the position of these two ball joints determines your two steering angles, the kingpin inclination angle and the caster angle. And from this video you would know that the position of these four ball joints, or changing the position of these four ball joints can change your roll center and pitch center. So these are basically the attachment points of what attaches your control arms to your car's chassis. And that last rod over there, that's for your steering, so one side of that will be connected to your steering rack and the other side will be connected to your steering knuckle. And even the angle for that, for, uh, for the steering knuckle is really important, but I'm going to talk about that later when I talk about the Ackerman steering geometry. But if this was the rear suspension, because there's no steering rack at the rear, so in that case this would also be mounted to the chassis. And there's usually a nut on it that's used for alignment, so you can adjust your toe angles at the rear.
So now the other really important thing to know about the placement of these control arms is that if you draw these yellow lines through each control arm, just like you did when measuring roll center, all these yellow lines should go back and intersect at the same point. This is important for eliminating any bumps here because if they're not aligned in this geometry, the suspension will not work properly. So the tire will likely change toe angle when it moves up and down. And the second thing is that all these ball joints, so the length of all these control arms should be such that if you draw these two yellow lines passing through all the ball joints, the yellow lines should be passing through all the ball joints and meaning that the control arms should follow these sequence of lengths. If you follow this, you can offset each control arm. So like you need to offset the steering rod because of the steering geometry. Um, but even if you offset it, but the angle and the length of the steering rod is right, that means that even when it's offset, when the wheel will move up and down, uh, the wheel should move up and down in a straight line and it shouldn't change any toe angle. So that would mean that you have zero bump steer. Bump steer is basically when your wheel moves up and down and it changes a slight bit of toe angle. And that's something I experimented with myself on my self-made car. I got the geometry at the rear so just slightly wrong. It was off by one centimeter. And what that would do is every time I would hit a bump, it would cause a toe out at the rear. And the car was really unstable at high speed because of that. And once I fixed that, it was amazing the difference it made because after that, the car was really stable, even going over bumps and everything. Um, so this is something that you really need to get right if you're um, designing or even working on a suspension or changing something on it. Now even the lengths or the difference in length of the lower and upper control arm do have a certain significant effect on the way the suspension moves. So the smaller you make the upper control arm, it will have an effect on what's called camber gains. So basically every time your car goes lower to the ground, your tires actually gain camber. And the purpose of that is that by default, if you, if you had a double wishbone suspension with all control arms of equal length, what would happen is that when your car will roll through a corner, your tires will roll along with it. So they will actually, so let's say your body rolls two degrees, your tires will lose camber by two degrees while going through a corner. So that's obviously a pretty bad effect, which is why you um, shorten the length of the upper control arm to counter that a little bit. And you can go really extreme with that and shorten the upper control arm to a point where there's no loss in camber when your car's body rolls. But the problem with going that extreme with these settings is that when your car will pitch under braking or um, squat down because of some other effect like going over a bump or aerodynamic force, it will gain an awful lot of camber even in a straight line, which is why you might lose a tremendous amount of grip in braking. So that's why you never go that extreme with shortening your upper control arms and you also rely on running a bit of static camber. So you run a bit of static camber and then you also shorten your upper control arms. So you're not losing that much camber when your car's body rolls through a corner. So now talking about some of the structural benefits of a double wishbone suspension, because apart from all the benefits this has in terms of geometry, it's also structurally a really good design. And the reason is, especially when you look at it the way it's used in racing cars, all the links are designed really straight and usually really cylindrical. They sometimes shape them for aerodynamic reasons, but usually you'll see them really straight and uh, almost cylindrical. And the reason is that the way the forces flow through them, so for each individual link, there's either going to be forces compressing them or extending them, but there's going to be no twisting or bending forces. So let's say when you go on the brakes in this car, these are the two forces that are going to be going through the upper control arm. So there's going to be one force trying to compress the link at the front, and the other force is going to be um, trying to extend the link at the back. And when it goes through corners, both the forces are going to be pointing in the same direction, so for lateral forces. And depending on which way your car is cornering, um, these arrows are going to be either pointing inwards or outwards. But the point is, there's going to be no bending or twisting forces. And even on the push rod, the push rod is also going to be compressed straight. And because the push rod is also connected at the lower control arm at a point where there's actually a pivot over there, so there's going to be no bending forces on the lower control arm either. So if you take a steel tube and you're only putting stresses on it on both ends, either compressing it or extending it, but there's no bending forces on it, you can get a lot of strength out of it, even if you make it really lightweight. So that's really the benefit of the design in these race cars, that they make these control arms out of carbon fiber and they're extremely lightweight. You can probably hit this control arm with a hammer right in the center and you'd probably be able to break it. But the amazing thing is the way it's being used to hold the wheel, you can even hit it hard on a curb or something and these control arms won't break because they provide a lot of strength in the way they're being used. Now in production cars, that's not the case because they often have to save a lot of space because they don't have that much space to make these control arms really long. Because the other thing that racing cars will do is they'll make these control arms really long because the longer you make the control arms, the more linearly you're moving the wheel up and down. Um, the shorter you make the control arms, the wheel will move up and down more in an arc, which is not that good. But in production cars, they don't have that much space to make these control arms that big. 
So that's why they will often compromise on the design and they will bend the control arms or shape them in a way so they can fit them in an actual car. So they don't make the best out of the double wishbone configuration, but it still is a lot better than some of the other suspensions out there. So now talking about the other really common suspension found in cars these days, that's going to be the McPherson strut. And almost every other production car is going to use this suspension in the front. Because it is really cheap to implement in cars, and what it basically is, is it's going to have the same lower control arm design as the double wishbone suspension, but the upper control arm is replaced by um, bolting the knuckle straight to the strut. And here's what it moves like. And this suspension is going to have three attachment points to the chassis, so two attachment points for the lower control arm, and then just one attachment point for the strut, where the strut is going to connect to the strut tower. And the reason why this design is so efficient to use in cars is because most cars, even when they use a double wishbone suspension, they're going to have a strut tower and a strut anyways. So we're simply replacing that upper control arm and bolting the strut straight to the knuckle saves them a lot of cost and it saves them a lot of space too because the upper control arm also takes quite a bit of space. Now because in this suspension you don't have a, an upper control arm with a ball joint so the steering axis is determined by the line passing through the uh, strut mounting point on the top and the ball joint on the lower control arm. And the roll center and pitch center in this suspension are measured by drawing a line perpendicular to the mounting point on the top strut because you can pretty much think of the strut as an infinitely long upper control arm because it moves linearly, so for a control arm to move linearly, it would have to be extremely long. And for controlling camber gains, you basically do that by angling the top of the strut towards the center of the car. So when the strut is angled, you can imagine that the strut will pull the top of the wheel towards itself when it initially starts to move up. So that's how you get camber gains. But the problem is that because the strut is moving linearly and the lower control arm is moving in an arc, eventually the arc of the lower control arm will catch up to the strut and then it will start to angle the uh, lower part of the wheel backwards too. So the wheel gains camber to a certain extent and then after that it starts losing camber again. So you never get as much camber gain with a strut type suspension as you do with the double wishbone suspension. And to increase the camber gain on this suspension you can do that by changing the angle of the strut. But the problem with that is that when you change the angle of the strut you're changing the kingpin inclination at the same time. Because the steering axis in this suspension is determined by where the top of the strut is mounted. And the caster angle in this suspension is also changed by changing the top mounting point on the strut. So usually the top mounting point is moved towards the rear of the car which gives you your caster angle. So in most of these suspensions you would have seen that the strut is angled when you look at it from the side and that's to give your caster angle. And because of angling the strut that also gives you that slight bit of rotation force when the wheel moves up. It actually depends on the angle of the lower control arm too but as far as the lower control arm is flat and the strut is angled that will give you that slight rotation when the wheel moves up which gives you that slight bit of lifting force when you stop your car every time. But the problem is that with this suspension, when you change the caster, you also change your pitch center because it's the same reason. So changing your roll center and pitch center are mainly done by changing the lower control arm in this suspension since there is no upper control arm and the strut basically, because of the strut, everything is fixed. Uh, and if you change the strut, you're changing your steering angles too, which is why usually for changing roll center and pitch center, people change the mounting points of the lower control arm. So that's really the biggest drawback of the suspension that first of all you can't get enough camber gain the same way you do in a double wishbone suspension and secondly you're limited with how much you can change with the angles because sometimes adjusting one angle does change the other and that's really the main reason why you won't see this type of suspension in a proper racing car or something but it still is extremely common in production cars. So I'll end the video over here and hopefully for all the other different types of suspensions like the multi-link suspension and the trilling arm or trilling link or if there's any other suspensions you guys want me to cover, I can make a part 3 and cover that. The Ackerman steering geometry, I've already almost finished that video so that will be up in a few days. But anyways, let me know if this video was helpful and thanks for watching.